I went to school for painting and drawing, and I kind of one day fell across playing with textiles. Um, and I guess I'll tell you guys, but it actually was from praying one day in my studio, and I was working with uh, texts that I was putting into paintings, and I had these little stencils, and they actually fell on my rug, and I started playing around with text, and I was like, this is an interesting concept. So um, that's kind of how the first one that's on the floor that says sit down and be humble started, where I was taking hip hop lyrics um, and showing the parallels of Islam and hip hop, um, which there's a lot of. Um, and as somebody who grew up in America, um, I think hip hop is one of the greatest exports out of America. I think it's one of the most powerful exports out of America. I think it's one of the most American things that solely came out of America. And um, so, tr tr kind of drawing that parallel as well as, um, you know, Muslims have been around forever. This is a new thing. Um, Muslims came with slaves um, to this country. So, they both are something that, in my mind, are very uh, American, just trying to m marriage a marriage of the two together. Um, so, that's how the piece on the floor started. And the one on the wall and even the fence kind of tied together a little bit more similarly is this um, idea I think now more people are having as opposed to what felt like when I was growing up I just had to answer was where are you from what is it to be American I think I mean even being here I'm hearing a lot of French I'm hearing languages from all over the world and what does that mean anymore to be American um, we're all in this space together and um, yeah, I think just, just answering that question, I think, you know, to be honest with the current um, government and powers that be, I think now a lot of people are really starting to question what it is to be American. And you're from here, you are here, but do you agree with your government? From people I talk to or don't talk to, right? Um, cure, the way I curate the artists that I choose to, to be in relationship with or works that I choose to be in relationship with, all led from wisdom technology and then facilitated through modern technology of Instagram. Great. Thank you. I can actually project pretty well. I, know <laughs> um, I thought it was fairly provocative what you said, that there is a strong parallel or intersection between Muslim and hip-hop, because in my Venn diagram of things, that's not overlapping. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, there's a lot, but um, you know, a lot of the first MCs are Muslim. Rakim is Muslim. Um, Mosef is Muslim. Like, there's a lot um, in in lyrics in some of my favorite songs. I mean, the, the, a lot of the series. I mean, I put it down the Kendrick, which he he's not Muslim, but um, a lot of the pieces I put, I've extracted lyrics from are actually referencing Islam. So there's like a root song where they're talking about the five pillars of Islam, and Malik B literally says what the five pillars of Islam are. And so for me, as somebody growing up, um, I didn't have people who look like me in media represented, but my first connection to being, you know, as they say, American, was actually through hip hop, and specifically through the, Mac, the black male story, you know, um, through hip hop, which is interesting. But um, it was through hip hop artists that it was like, hey, this is normal, and people are listening to this. and. You know, like, you know, we were talking about it where it's like, you know, he comes from a family of all different kinds of religion, but like, Islam's not, not part of his life. It's so, like, intertwined into who he is, and hip hop is intertwined into who he is, and his family members are hip hop artists and all of that. And so, um, and then just, you know, Islam is, you know, for better or worse, and hip hop, for better or worse, are like two of the fastest growing entities. I mean, Islam is one of the fastest growing religions. It's like, it's crazy. I mean, as much as people hate it, it really is. I mean, that's why people are trying to stop it, but it really is the fastest growing religion. And this isn't my opinion. I, I'm shocked by it sometimes. But, and hip hop just surpassed rock as the largest uh, growing form uh, genre of music around the world, not even just the US. So, um, and really, I feel like, you know, as much as America's imported, I, I really do believe that, like, um, hip-hop specifically is really one of the greatest imports out of the United States, and it's super American. It's become global, but it was from Queens, New York. Like, it is very American. Yes, it comes from jazz, and it comes from that, but it is black culture. And so that is, to me, something that is very American. Um, in, the fa in the fabric of America, hip-hop absolutely needs to be in that. And is it embraced? in Islamic culture? 
Um, in the sense that, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Muslims who, I have multiple friends who are Muslim who are MCs. Um, and uh, there's no difference because there's the poetry of Islam and there's that. Yes, there's people who, you know, have their uh, qualms about it, but that's in every religion when you get to fundamentalists or you get to extremists or you get to literalists. Um, that's not exclusive to Islam. You know what I mean? That's of any religion, whether it's uh, Judaism or it's Christianity. So people are like, no, nope, Muslim, uh, music is wrong. We don't listen to music. So I obviously don't tend to be someone who leads to that. So I know the community that I grew up in, and that was never a part of my reality. Uh, music was a big part of our culture growing up. And um, so I can only speak to what I know. And from what I know, that is what I know. You know, I grew up on hip hop, and um, that was normal. And it was the first time I really heard. Islam and Muslims speaking way before there's like the Hassan Minajes and there's all these people American comedians, that's close enough, you know, but like it's still not my reality, you know. Um, but that for me, that was the first time where it felt like, okay, cool, like this is very American, who I am as a Muslim. It's not this other, it's not this where are you from, what is your religion, you're different. It's like I, the religion surpasses me being here, my family being here. We didn't bring Islam, you know, it's been here. Um, so, yeah, is that also that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, then the series, the, the, the series that is uh, of the lyrics, hip hop lyrics, it's called Music Is My Sanctuary, which is a Gary Bard's jazz song. Um, and there also is that parallel to me when I go to hip hop shows, more so than a church, a synagogue, a mosque, it's one of the most diverse places I'll be in is the audience of a hip hop show. You know what I mean? You have white, black, old, young, gay, straight, transgender, you have all kinds of people and it's, it becomes this, uh, there is a sanctuary religiousness about music, regardless of whether it's hip hop. And when you see an MC on stage, he's like this messiah. You can't face the other way, people will think you're weird. You gotta face the audience and there's lights on them. And you know, they say scream, you scream, they say hey, you say, like, I mean literally they tell you sit, we probably all sit. Like there is this kind of messiah complex too, um, for, for the better or worse, you know? So. There's even just that of, of music and its religiosity, you know, of, of drawing that parallel of people are also often very like, oh, religion I don't want to talk about, but they're like, everyone subscribes to some form of religion, of morals they believe in, lines they won't cross, people they listen to, words they listen to, music you listen to, understanding stories, it comes from somewhere. So institutionalizing religion is one thing, but um, I think we're all kind of a part of it. Yeah, no, I just wanted to kind of allude to what you said to just like the way that I grew up. So I would say even in that Venn diagram, um, once you really understand hip hop, I mean, every member of Wu-Tang identified with a specific set of the nation of Islam called the Five Percenter Nation, right? And um, even within the Five Percenters, if you've ever heard of this clothing brand called Supreme, right, which is probably one of the most important hip hop clothing brands, people are laughing because they know stuff. Uh, uh, if you know about Supreme, if you don't know about Supreme, you should research them. They're a, a skateboarding brand, which literally got a billion dollar valuation. Uh, they get their name from a five percenter who was, who was, and who, who was a Muslim who was also a drug dealer. And like, so, so, and, and the reason why Supreme has their red logo is because all of these people identified as five percenters, which is a part of the nation of Islam, which comes from obviously like Muslim teachings where they all wore red leather jackets that had white supreme written across the back. Like that's how they're being identified. So to kind of separate hip hop from Islam is, especially today, is to also um, not have a full, complete understanding of what hip hop is as well. So a lot of the most important movements that make hip hop today um, directly come from Islam and the 5% of the nation as well. So I think it's just also about just having access to that sort of information and really respecting these people who are entrepreneurs in their community and understanding the culture that they created in a real way. If anybody have a question that they're thinking and like not wanting to raise their hand, you can just ask me. Yeah. Ooh, look at this. Um, so 
Yeah. This is a totally half baked thought, but it's something that's on my mind and it's relevant to both. That's what this is for. Yeah, we're all great. This goes back to what you said initially, which is let's have a conversation because we're all here at this point in time. And you had said too about sort of that in musical performances, how that togetherness and that sort of superseding consciousness yeah. takes a hold. Yeah. How do you, since for since the topic is re-engineering humanity and how people consume things, how do you plan to sort of help replicate that energy that's created when people are in the same room at the same time? I mean, everything we're doing is about posterity and somebody looking at it when it's convenient for them and you know, trolls come out on the internet, don't come out in real life kind of thing. Like, it's such an interesting question to me. I don't so I'll, I'll touch on it, and then I want to open it up to, to maybe Boone me or uh, more of what to say. So for me, you know, um, so the next phase, if I can make a plug for phase two, is uh, AI based on artificial intelligence, but the show is AI applied imagination. So it's essentially thinking about artificial intelligence differently. Um, so I will start by saying this here is a program that I've written. And so each of you will take a piece of the code with you into the world. You'll be responsible for debugging as you go along. And so this code will live out in the world through each of you. So that's <laughs> in short answer. We can talk more in the gallery uh, when we wrap up the panel. But in short answer, it's you. So I don't have to be responsible for replicating this because I've already written the code and the software is in place and running you'll be responsible for replicating the vibe, essentially. And you'll be responsible for debugging the vibe when you feel like the vibe is off. You'll re-engineer the vibe when you feel the vibe is off and elevate it to where you feel it needs to be based on your internal compass or your internal diagnostic of the software, of the code. You get me? Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, there's excitement in the digital also. <laughs> that's how things go viral. And, and that's the energy. But is it the same exact excitement you get in the physical, in a concert? No, they're different. They're completely different. Uh, but I truly believe that, you know, I think anybody who's been on Twitter arguing of politics with somebody feels their heartbreak go off. Uh, I mean, if you see, if you see somebody you have a crush on <laughs> doing a live story on Instagram, you check it out and you know what, your heart flutters. So a lot of that stuff actually does transfer to the digital because we're human. At the heart of it, we remain the same. But what happens is the ecosystem that we inhabit changes as we shift from the physical to the digital. I know, like, when I hear the question again. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's just sort of like, how do you replicate the energy that happens when people are in a room together? You know, if the topic is re-engineering humanity, let's think about how we can do that digitally. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm thinking specifically at, like, um, those shell casings that are in this space. And what was interesting for me with that work, or with just those cases in general, is that every time, I don't know if any of you guys witnessed one of the, do you guys see like any of the bullets drop? I did, yeah, what we did. The bullets drop. Yeah. In the, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, so in, in the piece, um, there is a shell casing that will drop each time um, somebody tweets, um, stop gun violence. And um, I just think it's interesting that like, even while people are in the space, um, the shells are dropping, they're probably dropping as somebody's tweeting it, but the attention around it is not really, there's no focus. And I think that um, for me it's an, it's an interesting thing because in a sense it's like, what's happening in the space and how it's seen is like something that's happening out of these doors. And it's like, um, these things are happening. And I, I think just by, you know, kind of reminding people they're like prompting them that this is a thing, or even knowing that this is a thing that's happening, it's kind of being overlooked even in our space, kind of maybe if it's not changing anything, it's like showing us what our attitude is towards towards these things. Where it's like we're either so desensitized that yeah, yeah, 
it's happened and like you go no pun intended but um <laughs> you go about your day but um i, I think that um I, I like or i'm interested in like how to challenge or like how to show humanity or like how, how we can like look at ourselves in the mirror mm -hmm. um yeah through art through art through art um or yeah through these kind of like propositions um i feel like it's important to remind ourselves um at like some of the ills i guess that we ourselves kind of push out mm -hmm. So we have time for, I think, like a few more. Um, I love what you just said about um, the, that we come here and then you give us code and we plug it in. Because before I came here, I was uh, explaining to my 85-year-old mother what Marchand's art is about. And, um, you know, it was a little complicated. But when I can explain to her, it's about the plasticity of a woman and how we go through so many changes. and. You know, her body is, is like, breaking down and, and, like, you know, going completely against her will, as, as all of us do at some point. And um, so it's, like, really interesting to watch that experience and, and to, like, be with her and try to, you know, do that and know that she can't go back, you know? Like, we can spend all the money we want on the outside, but inside, you know, it's, like, it's still going to break down. And... Um, so it's it's kind of interesting. I can say, hey, you know, it's about a feminist statement about the flexibility of, of the woman and how we constantly change, and and also we constantly change in our duties and our you know performance of what we do in the world. So and I'm so stoked it went viral, like thanks to the internet, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to add something else about re-engineering humanity because you know you brought up the subject of Instagram. And you know, ladies and and I always riff on this one about the collectively sourced imagination. Yes. That you know, Instagram and the internet to a large extent has become this sort of like collectively sourced human imagination. So it's all of us sort of playing together uh, with imagination. And you know, 21st century has been called you know, the, the century of the imagination and all the technologies. And and on, on a lot of levels, the story of art is the story of human imagination. And, um, and, and with the technology that we now have, we're all externalizing the human imagination, whether it's through the internet or virtual reality technologies. And, um, and you know, the tricky part of the imagination is that it has all our best hopes and aspirations in it, but you know what, it has all our worst fears and hatred and everything else in it. And when we look to the internet, that's what we see. We're all externalizing, I mean, you, you, you literally, if I, if I disagreed with somebody at this party over politics, I wouldn't feel like my entire existence was threatened. But if somebody crit critiques a political post of mine on the internet, I immediately think my life is threatened and I have to hit back. But that's one of the ways, that is one of the ways that we're externalizing our imagination. So the way we're really re-engineering humanity is together through this crowdsourced imagination. And it's like, you know, it's, it's a terrifying thing and a truly exhilarating thing at the same time because we have absolutely no way to predict it. Do we have time for one more question? Or no? uh, yeah. One short question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> quickly, two short questions quickly we'll answer and then meet us in the gallery. And then as she alluded to about this crowdsourced imagination, that's why the next show, AI, which is all AI artworks, it's called Applied Imagination instead of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, just a quick plug about that, but please, yeah, two short questions and then we'll, and two short answers, and we'll continue to go. So I'm afraid mine is not such a short question, so I'll defer to the well, other person. Well, ask, ask your question, we'll give you short answers. Yeah. Yeah. We'll follow it up in the gallery. So my question is, uh, or my comment and then question is that, um, is about how artists, how you as artists are reframing human connection in new terms and in using new ways to uh, create new connections. And in that way, you're leading the generation behind you forward. At the same time, the generation ahead of you, and that would include your mom, are not conversant in this new language. And how can people of all ages be embraced in the new paradigm that you're talking about. So in short answer, all the artwork in there. 
I mean, so the, all of that artwork for the most part is tech enabled. And um, yeah, it's all tech enabled, even the frameworks, that's wisdom technology. And if that's a new term that you're familiar with, cool, let's discuss more. But prayer, meditation, contemplation, uh, taking a moment for peace, that's a type of technology that has allowed human beings to uh, not destroy ourselves, essentially. It's allowed us, it's the rudder that's allowed us to keep the ship uh, on the course. So there was one more? It's more about taking it into 3D and 3D printing and doing new mediums of technology where you can just pump that across the world, interact with other artists. Yeah. Has there been any of that going on in your world? I mean, Instagram. It, I mean, so I've done 3D, I've done 3D printing stuff. Um, Marjan, do you want to speak about your 3D printing sculpture? So she has a piece in the next show that's super, super awesome. It's a 3D printed sculpture with some augmented reality. Well, you know, I think uh, uh, I've done uh, 3D printing also, and uh, um, uh, the issue with 3D printing is that it's finicky and it's expensive. <laughs> so we're not currently, um, we're not really currently in a place to make it on demand, uh, you know, globally in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a mass way. But you know, the, the, I, I mean, I look at the Creality, and, and uh, the, there's a new $300 printer. That's incredibly reliable. It's a workhorse. It doesn't break down. And there's like an entire hobby market that's mushroomed around it on, on the internet. I'm a member of a lot of groups. So, you know, I, I'm literally watching average people print out like life size Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> that's what the technology does. But I think that um, connecting the virtual to the physical is the most uh, exciting aspect. Uh, of, uh, of you know of everything that's happening in, in 3D CG now, and and to make it more accessible, to improve the quality, and to uh, make it more on demand. Thank you guys very much.